Uh, so hi guys, uh, welcome to a defense of whoever you think was behind the Sony Pictures uh, Entertainment Breach. Uh, real quick, who am I? Uh, my name is Brandon Tanzi. I'm a security researcher at Landcope over in Alpharetta. Alpharetta, Atlanta. Basically the same if you're not from around there. They're actually completely different, but geographically they're quite close. Um, my screen's freaking out pretty hard, actually. gonna have to wing it a little bit. Anyway, um, this is my second time at Freaknik. Uh, the first time I was able to kind of make jokes about how in Atlanta Freaknik means a completely different thing. Um, and that led to some kind of funny stories because I was new to Atlanta. Um, but this is my second time here now. I know the difference. So I can't really make that joke, even though I just kind of did. Um, so almost about a year ago today, uh, November 2014, uh, employees of Sony Pictures uh, came into work and saw this awesome thing on their background on their desktops. Uh, we'll talk about this image a bit, because I show it off everywhere. It's on my screensaver. It was a background of mine for a little bit. I use it for kind of every presentation that I give. Um, so we will definitely go further into it. Uh, and I don't just show you this for laughs. Uh, this is actually kind of what got me into the Sony Pictures malware. Um, it's just such an in-your-face thing that we don't typically get to see from malware, uh, especially malware that does anything kind of cool. Uh, it makes me think of the Thunderstruck malware. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Uh, it was never actually confirmed to really exist, but it's really cool, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, it was something that Mick O'Hippinen, I think from F-Secure, uh, first found out about. Uh, and they never received a sample, but somebody from, and I have to read this, the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran uh, reported malware samples that got onto some of their computers. Overnight, it would turn up all the volume and blast ACDC's Thunderstruck. Mm -hmm. It's just like such an awesome, in-your-face kind of like, we're here. That really, I don't know, is kind of cool, considering most malware tries to generally be the complete opposite. Um, so this isn't the last image that we are, wow, my screen is really hurting. This isn't the last image that we're going to talk about here, um, but this is another one. Uh, and it's super dark, um, so this is going to be a much harder challenge than intended. Um, but this is another one of the screenshots um, from November 24th. Uh, the attackers that compromised Sony's network also got a bunch of their social media accounts uh, and tweeted a bunch of weird stuff. Um, so again, you guys are all sitting conveniently far back, uh, and the screen is conveniently squished. Uh, but can anyone see anything cool here to point out? Obama. What was that? Obama. Uh, I guess it kind of does look like that here. Uh, okay. I was going to wait for at least one person to say something, so thank you. And everybody thanks you. Um, I have a few things here circled. Uh, and now that you can see I've circled them, maybe it'll be a little bit easier for you to see. Um, yeah, you guys are going to have a really hard time, because there's going to be lots of screenshots of like text and stuff, and it's already squished, so just don't say I didn't warn you. Uh, anyway, we've got four circles here. One, uh, in red on the bottom left, is a tombstone that says Sony Pictures. Uh, on the bottom, in a green circle, are two people. Uh, I don't think it's Obama. On, on my picture, it's a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we have there Michael Linton uh, and Amy Pascal. Uh, Amy Pascal, I believe, was the... Uh, co-chairman at the time. Wow, I did not expect anyone to heed that. Thank you very much. Uh, Amy Pascal was the co-chairman of Sony Pictures at the time of the breach. Uh, she's now gone. Uh, and the man there with the lovely axe in his head is Michael Linton, who is the CEO of Sony Pictures. Uh, up in the purple, which is a little bit too dark for you to see now, as a sign that says Sony. And then finally in the blue, we see this message that says hacked by GOP. Uh, so with that, I submit to you that GOP was behind the Sony breach. Uh, and I can give you back your time. That's not actually what I'm trying to show you. Uh, behind the Hacked by GOP sign, uh, there are a picture of two arches. Uh, so if you were to Google Sony Pictures Entertainment, you'd see those two arches. They're what lead you into Sony's campus. And they actually say Sony Pictures on them. Um, so very rarely do we see, I guess, malware uh, authors with graphic designers on their team, especially graphic designers stuck in like the 90s. But I just felt it cool to point out, because this really, the imagery is really kind of a, a cool part about the breach. Uh, anyway, versions of the images that I just showed you appeared all over the internet on uh, November 24th, uh, 2014. We had employees posting pictures from their phones. When I say we, I didn't work there, but I mean, us as a general internet community uh, saw Sony Pictures employees posting images from their phones. Um, we saw images like this on their websites. Uh, they were all over the place. Um, and then just a few days later, we saw this uh, FBI flash uh, come out and get posted to the internet. So some of you in here may be kind of like, grinding your teeth and saying, hey, that's TLP Green, what are you doing? Uh, well, for one, I think we all in here count as part of the broader community. Uh, and two, this FBI flash in particular has been very widely reported on uh, and reposted. Uh, so I think having this here uh, is fair. 
Uh, anyway, this document, if you were to read the whole thing, doesn't actually mention Sony Pictures. Um, it's kind of funny that they didn't because it got kind of obvious. Uh, the behavior that this lists uh, for the individual malware samples was very similar to what we heard about in Sony, uh, but most crucially, it had a bunch of hashes. Uh, and hashes are what we use to be able to pull down different malware samples to be able to analyze them. Uh, so I did that, and that for me was exciting, right? Because I like malware analysis. It's just kind of a thing that I do, a thing I like to do. Um, so for this, it changed the Sony breach uh, for kind of, from like a spectator sport to me for a bit of a sing-along. Um, so I downloaded those hashes, and lo and behold, this, is, uh, this here is what I found. Um, so it's a very similar uh, image to the one I showed you before, but it told me I was on the right track, right? So I ran the malware, I saw this big screenshot, and I said, hey, I think I'm onto something. It looks like we've actually got the malware um, that affected Sony. Um, and that was helpful, because I, finally, I finally had something that I could sink my teeth into, which was convenient, because lots of people started asking questions. Um, like I mentioned, I, I work at Lanco. Uh, we're a security vendor. When you're a security vendor and something like this happens, uh, internally, people start asking tons of questions, and externally, uh, people start asking tons of questions. Uh, what happened? Then the internal question that came up very, very quickly was, <laughs> are they customers? Um, I guess you can't answer one way without making the other one kind of unclear, so I'm just going to not answer. Um, who did it? Right, that was the popular question. People like to point fingers super quickly, and we'll talk a lot about that. Um, would our product, well, you and me are a little, little bit of different uh, slides here with the display, so we're going to step forward a couple. Basically, we were getting all these questions about the functionality of the malware, right? People want to know what sales should say. People want to know what support should say. You know, when you work at a vendor like, at times like this, you get customers calling up and say, hey, if this happens to me, what do I do? Or if this happened to me, how would I investigate this? People have all these questions. Then marketing, right? Marketing wants blog posts. Because at a time like this, customers, uh, even when they're not the ones involved, kind of expect you to have all the answers. And you want to have all the answers, right? Having the answers is cool. Um, so that's what I tried to get. Um, so this was the first slide, and this will be, I think, the last time I mentioned my company, so don't worry, it's not like a, a product demo, but this was the first slide of a presentation that I gave internally uh, to all of our sales staff, support staff, anybody who wanted to kind of find out a bit more, right? What we wanted to kind of inform them of is, A, uh, what did people say happened? B, what can we tell really happened? And C, how would, you know, our stuff have dealt with this? Um, that said, I, I show you this screen in particular kind of for a little bit of a humor, but this was actually the title. Uh, and I show you it just to say I really kind of was following this all around the clock. Sorry, my display is really creeping and some notes here that I was hoping to kind of have. Uh, anyway, when I was doing my research to put this together, I kind of came up with a few issues that I had. One, um, I'm kind of a, a conservative person when it comes to making claims, right? So I was seeing some things, hints of things, um, that other people were sort of stating as complete fact, complete truth. Uh, and I wasn't sure how they were able to do that. And then two, I saw a lot of people uh, kind of re reposting or re-reporting these claims, right? So if one person says something that's kind of iffy, I'm making up names here completely, but you know, let's say the New York Times says uh, you know South Africa was behind the attack, and they have really bad info. It's a really lame claim. Then the Wall Street Journal comes along and says, hey, the New York as the New York Times reports, South Africa was behind the hack of Sony Pictures. People there take it and they run with it. And the original lack of facts kind of doesn't matter at all. Uh, and this is sort of a thing that bugged me. Um, so I'm not sure who in here, I'd wager most of us, are either technical people or, or maybe even technical employees places. Uh, is anyone here in incident response working a SOC? Okay, cool. Um, well, for, for those of you who don't, I guess, uh, when people hire you, uh, they don't necessarily hire you just for your ability to parrot back facts. Right? They're hiring you to do something that they either can't uh, do or don't have the time to do. Right? So when you're doing a report on an incident, it's very easy to say, here are the exact facts, I tell you nothing more. Um, but that's dangerous, because you're forcing other people to draw their own conclusions. And these are people who often aren't equipped to be able to do that. Uh, that's what we saw here, and that's kind of what the point of this presentation is going to be about. Um, so does anyone recognize this picture? Sorry? It's not church hall, though. No, no. Anybody? OK. Uh, so this here is Richard Baitlich. Uh, this used to be his Twitter profile picture. Um, so he's the chief security strategist at <coughs> FireEye, and he was the CISO of Mandiant uh, before they got acquired. So about a month or two ago, shirts relevant, uh, I was at Security Onion Con in Augusta, Georgia, and besides Augusta. Uh, he was one of the ones giving the keynote, excuse me, giving a keynote at besides Augusta, excuse me, at Security Onion Con. 
Uh, anyway, just due to the way they have the event hosted, uh, they have kind of one big screen, uh, one big uh, PowerPoint that they used to do all the intro stuff. Uh, their projector was also much larger than this. Um, so he's giving his keynote, and standing behind him is like a 20-foot image of his face. Um, and presumably he didn't put it there, because he felt the need to kind of comment on it. He goes, it's really weird to speak in front of a giant picture of myself without at least explaining you know, what that picture was. Uh, so he goes on to explain that uh, Mandiant, the company at the time, was uh, actually involved with the investigation of Sony Pictures, uh, along with the FBI. Uh, and what this picture itself is from, uh, he was on some kind of TV show, I guess. I don't uh, remember that part of the story. But this picture was him uh, on stage with somebody who claimed to know the entire inside view, the entire inside story of the Sony Pictures breach. This person said they had all the information, and they were willing to share a lot of it. Um, he, being involved with the investigation, also felt that he had all of the information, or at least a lot of it, and disagreed with everything this guy was saying. Unfortunately, he was paid to be part, I guess fortunately, but unfortunately in this context, he was paid to be part of the investigation, so he couldn't correct the guy. Instead, he just sat there and gave him this glare the whole time. Um, so he told this story, and I go, well, hey, hang on, this is kind of relevant. I'm, I was super interested in this. Um, so I went up to him, and I talked a bit about it. And I said, hey, you know, uh, something that's bugged me is the fact that I don't think there's enough information out there for anyone to really actually know what happened. Um, so I told him that, and I asked him, have you seen any theories, any blog posts, any reports, whatever, um, that accurately kind of describe the situation you know, as you guys saw? Uh, and he quickly answered, no, I haven't. I then also quickly asked, do you mind if I repeat that? And he quickly answered, no. Um, so with that, Richard Bage. Um, so with that, I kind of would like to tell you who I think the Guardians of Peace are. Um, so I'm proud to announce here today the Guardians of Peace are I absolutely have no idea. Um, if you expected anything else, you did not read the talk bio. Um, you've not been paying attention. But that's OK. Welcome back. Um, instead, what I'd like to talk about is the fact that I have no idea, uh, and then the fact that I wager that kind of most other people uh, have no idea either. Cool. Uh, so I mentioned that I, I gave a presentation at Freaknik. I gave two last year. Uh, one was about assembly, and one was about malware analysis. Uh, so these are two slides from another slideshow I gave. I'm hoping to be able to use this slide next year. I think it'd be kind of cool and ultimately completely unreadable. Um, but the titles of these two slides on the top left are one, what do we know? Uh, no is underlined, no is italicized. Uh, it, would, it is bolded, but so is everything else, so you can't tell. Uh, and the other one is what do we think we know? Um, and this is a very important distinction to make. Uh, at first I'd say it's a very important distinction in malware analysis, but it's really a very important distinction when you're, I guess, investigating anything, right? And this has kind of played a huge part uh, and I, what I think were uh, people's investigations into Sony Pictures. So we'll kind of review some of the facts and some of the things that I kind of disagree with being facts uh, throughout the timeline of the breach, uh, the malware, and then the communications from the attackers. So, again, I bring back these screenshots. I told you it wouldn't be the last time you saw them. Um, on the morning of September 20, November 24th, excuse me, 2014, uh, Sony Pictures employees showed up to work and saw these things. Um, so I, I remarked on the lovely red skeleton and the tombstone and all that stuff, but what's actually important here um, are the links, or the URLs. I guess you can't click them. Uh, if you would have fetched one of these URLs at the time, you would have found a zip. Uh, and in this zip, you would have found three files. Hey. Uh, whoop. Whatever. Up there is just the date. That's going to keep getting cut off, I guess, but it's cool. Um, so this one here was on... Oh, I can't see it either. Oh, oh, sorry, this was the same file. Uh, so when we opened up that zip, spedata.zip, we saw three files. Uh, one was called list1.txt, the other list2.txt, uh, and then finally readme.txt. Uh, if we take a look into readme, this is what we see. We see a very short message from the attackers uh, with a list of email addresses. Uh, and these become very important, and we'll talk about them in a little bit. Um, but then at the bottom, you see uh, a quick wc-l uh, to count the amount of lines in uh, both list1 and list2. There were 38 million files. And these are presumably the names of the files that the Sony Pictures attackers had claimed to have stolen. So time went on a little bit. We got to November 27th. And November 27th was the first time that we saw any of this data actually come out for real. Um, we saw a couple of Sony Pictures movies that were at the time unreleased uh, show up to various torrent sites. Uh, so this was cool. Uh, it was cool because, A, some people wanted to see these movies. Um, but it was cool for me um, because this was the first time that we'd seen that this data was actually really taken, right? People say all sorts of stupid stuff. Um, sometimes they mean it. And in this case, it looks like they're at least kind of beginning to mean it, right? We're seeing actual Sony data that no one else has had before 
show up online. Uh, and a few days later, we get to December 1st. Uh, on December 1st, we have a message that you can see up top. Uh, you can download a part of Sony Pictures' internal data, the volume of which is tens of terabytes on the following address is. Uh, these may include pieces of confidential data. Um, so this message also did have a bunch of links. They're dead now. I can share them if you want them. It was really just for space purposes that I cropped it. Um, but on December 1st, we also learned that the FBI had gotten involved uh, and that Mandiant had gotten involved. So this first leak, um, movies had come out prior, but this first mass leak following the movies was about 26 gigs. Uh, in this leak, we saw a lot of employee information, uh, things like names, social security numbers, work histories, salaries, uh, addresses, all this sort of stuff. Um, 26 gigs is a lot of it, right? And only a few days later, it was actually confirmed to be real. Um, now, say what you want, we probably assumed that, frankly. Um, that much data that looked that real is probably kind of hard to fake. But again, we're talking about separating fact from fiction, right? So to have the different Sony execs, Sony execs come out and speak to the legitimacy of that data that was really helpful for us. So that was nice. Uh, then on December 3rd, we saw yet another leak. Um, this message here had kind of two things that were kind of actually helpful and critical uh, for us. This one was almost made for security researchers. This contained a list of all their internal systems, uh, a list of plain text passwords, all these sort of things that were kind of not really sure why that's what they leaked, but were kind of helpful to us. Right? They gave us a picture of how bad the infrastructure was inside. Uh, so these were passwords for all their social media accounts, again, internal FTP servers, uh, HR services, financial services, security certificates. Uh, all of these things got leaked. And this actually became really uh, useful information. Uh, because one of the popular theories, and again, we'll go over these in a little bit, um, that was circulated a lot was that insiders were involved with the attack. Uh, and one of the reasons people said that was because, hey, look at the malware. The malware knew all about their network. Only an insider can know about that much about your network. And I found that funny for two reasons. One, it's just a complete you know, kind of grasping at straws, but two, you know, I've worked in IT departments. Being an insider does not guarantee you that info, right? Uh, and it was kind of proven here because all of this IT documentation was leaked, right? So this goes to show that it didn't have to be someone who knew already. It was someone who could have found this information and they've demonstrated um, that they did. Um, so something that's different about this uh, email here, uh, we don't have to read it all. I've bolded the important part for you. You're welcome to though. It's tough, the wording is a little weird. Uh, anyway, something that's different about this email uh, is that this one did not come with a leak of data attached. Um, and that brings in a lot of questions about its authenticity, um, but I still wanted to pick it out. Because if we take a look at the bold, it says, or right above the bold, uh, many things beyond imagination will happen in many places of the world. Our agents find themselves acting necessary places. Please sign your name to object to the false of the company at the email address below if you don't want to suffer damage. If you don't, not only you but your family will be in danger. Um, so the FBI kind of denied the legitimacy of the threats. They said the email was real. They denied the legitimacy of the threats. Um, but this is something that kind of changes the attack for a lot of people. Uh, let's say you were an employee at Sony Pictures and a film script gets stolen. Yeah, I mean, that sucks, right? But it's something that happened to work. It's something that happened to a business. You're a step removed, right? You can go home, you can have dinner, you can watch a movie, and then come back the next day and begin to deal with it again. Um, but when you're your family like this is getting threatened um, by someone who's demonstrated that they have your address, you know, your personal work history, all that stuff, uh, it becomes a bit different, right? And it makes your computer a lot harder to unplug and walk away and be done with it. Uh, you know, it makes you really invest and involved. So the next day we got, um, another handful of leaks. Uh, and we're almost getting to the end of the leaks part, so don't worry, but it's important to go through this history. Um, so this leak here contained uh, yet more financial data. So this one was, I have to scroll up for the number from my displays freaking, 150 gigs. 150 gigs of banking statements, uh, financial forecasts, financial reports, uh, purchase receipts, licensing information, all sorts of financial data on behalf of Sony. Uh, and 150 gigs. Um, the attackers continuously say that they've got tens of terabytes, but 150 gigs is one of the biggest leaks that we've seen at the time. Uh, finally, a few days later, uh, we get another email. Uh, and this one is kind of interesting because A, it says that these, uh, atta the attackers here are uh, authenticating themselves by the use of including more leaks of data with their email, deny being behind the threatening email. So this already tells you that we've got some funny stuff going on. And we will talk a lot more about that funny stuff uh, as we go on, but they began to leak a bit more. So here, instead of just kind of background financial information, they begin going after executives. Uh, so what we saw here was a seven gigabyte uh, Outlook OST file, or I'm sorry, two files making up about seven gigs. Uh, one for Amy Pascal, who was the co-chairman of Sony Pictures, 
and another for Stephen Mosco, uh, who was the president of Sony Pictures Television. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone here has been grocery shopping in the past year or so, um, but if you have, you've probably checked out the stealing is wrong and seen the grocery store aisle magazines, all the entertainment magazines. Lots of headlines have come out of, in particular, uh, this OST. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, the specifics aren't very important for today. Um, but what we've seen is a lot of people discussing uh, the way that high-level executives at the movie studios were talking about their talent, and talent was talking about each other. Um, so it's gossip, right? But it's the sort of thing that this kind of industry trades on and is built on, right? Those relationships that they have with uh, the talent they work with. Um, finally, for the first time, we actually see one of the attacker emails, uh, this one on December 10th, uh, that references some kind of demands. Right before this, they hadn't really told us what they wanted. Uh, they just kind of keep doing things. They still haven't told us what they wanted. Uh, they've at least told us that they've done uh, something, or that they want something. Uh, so this one came with a five gig leaks, a five gigs of leaks, uh, mostly around anti-piracy efforts. Uh, so people learned that, for example, Sony Pictures had a 100% track record uh, when it came to issuing ISP takedowns. Um, it showed notices that they'd sent to end users about copyright infringement, uh, proposals on censoring search results. Um, so again, the more of this that comes out, uh, the less good that it is, really, uh, for Sony Pictures. Uh, again, more leaks for personnel. This is December 10th still. Um, it came out that uh, Lee Wei Whale, I'm not really sure how you pronounce that, but the general counsel for Sony Pictures had uh, her OST leaked with the promise of more interesting data to come. So I think we've got like three more days of leaks and we're on to what I consider the more, uh, the, the more fun stuff. So we have another six and a half gigs of anti-piracy leaks with the promise of more interesting data. Um, the fact that this points out is that this data keep coming out in staggered form, right? We see more emails here, uh, allowing you to actually request the data you want to see, um, which is, I guess, kind. Um, so here what we see is, is kind of one of the first uh, threats from these attackers. Um, they're actually threatening to release the uh, email inboxes of all of the individuals on the SP employees, right? So not just the executives, not just you know, general counsel, board members, things like that, um, but everybody. Um, so, you know, we don't know how many people actually emailed them. We don't know if anyone did. We don't know what their goal was for them. But they were soliciting communication um, with, I guess, various actual Sony Pictures employees. And then finally, December 15th, finally was the wrong word, um, but on December 15th, we saw a class action lawsuit uh, come up by Sony Pictures employees against Sony Pictures. Um, it's kind of hard to defend against a lawsuit like this. Uh, when A, you've got a memo written uh, that says you are accepting way too much risk uh, by your IT policy. Two, the fact that people know about that memo was because it got leaked because of your IT security policy. Uh, and three, when people submit that memo to evidence. Um, so actually very recently, I think, it, if not this, one of the class action lawsuits just got settled uh, for millions of dollars. Um, again, not really a convenient way to, to get busted on a lawsuit. Uh, and then finally, one of the last leaks um, is actually the first one mentioning the interview, right? So I'm not sure if anybody remembers when this was going on or how closely you followed it, um, but people have been talking about North Korea and talking about the interview the whole time, right? It was kind of like the obvious leak. But this is the first time that we actually see the attackers mention the interview. Um, so that's something important to note. Uh, in addition here, they're threatening physical violence. Uh, they claimed it wasn't them the first time, but now they're saying to remember uh, the 11th of September 2001. We recommend you to keep yourself distant from the places at that time. If your house is nearby, you'd better leave. Um, the FBI, again, said that none of these threats were substantiated. Um, but as a result, Sony Pictures announced that they were going to cancel the initial screenings of the interview. Uh, in addition, people were speculating, the New York Times actually, cites an unnamed US government source uh, saying that North Korea was behind the attack. Um, two days later, the FBI actually confirmed that. They said, hey, that a name source was correct. You know, we suspect uh, North Korea to be behind this attack. And then December 24th, uh, the last date that I think I have uh, on the slide next, we're moving past. Sony Pictures decided to actually air and screen uh, the interview. Uh, so I'm not sure who here remembers, but we had lots of sites that were willing to stream it. Uh, so to get it right, it was YouTube, Google Play, uh, Xbox, and then a Sony uh, branded website hosted by a service named Kernel. Now, I'm not really sure if irony is the right term here, um, but there was a bug on the, the kernel-hosted service where anybody with the actual link to the media stream could watch it and download it. Um, so sure enough, very almost immediately after uh, people kind of hosted this on kernel, uh, this movie too was leaked. 
Um, again, just kind of funny given the context of everything else that happened. Uh, so with that, you know, we talk about the attackers. Right? The attackers have claimed to have tens of terabytes of data. Uh, they claim to say, if you release the interview, we're going to do all these terrible things. We've got so much more interesting data to come. Uh, contact us. We'll even you know, post the data that you want to see. Um, despite that, we actually haven't seen. That's kind of weird. Um, again, they, they said they have all this data and the plans to release it all, but the thing that they supposedly were not looking forward to happened, and they just decided to call it a day and kind of move on, uh, at least as far as we know from the outside. That said, this is the kind of speculation, this is a road we can go down that I want to avoid, uh, and I'll tell you about why in just a moment. Uh, anyway, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the run through because I, I think the actual background data is kind of cool, um, but the problem with that information of, is that none of that is really technical, uh, none of that is concrete. Right? And that's the information we want to look for and talk about to try and figure out if we actually think somebody, there is somebody to point fingers at uh, in terms of the breach. Um, so this sort of information allows people to come up with all sorts of theories. And that's kind of cool, um, but you end up with this uh, term that I kind of made up, I think, I Googled it, didn't find anything, uh, called Warshak. Warshak? Anybody? Warshak? Yeah. Warshak? Warshak. Boom, yeah. got it. It's like I practiced. Um, Warshak, Warshak, attribution. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone here has ever watched like any kind of mystery TV show or you know an NCIS or anything like that, uh, anything where someone is trying to solve a crime. Uh, what often happens is that you know your your superhero sleuth ends up seeing one or two things, and based upon those things they connect some dots, and they find their killer or their thief or whatever. Um, you know that's kind of cool because uh, when you're a fictional character, if your writers want you to succeed, you will, and it's a cool thing about fiction. We can have people do whatever they'd like. Um, but sometimes the real world doesn't actually kind of work that way, right? Just because we see a couple of dots and manage to connect them doesn't mean they're actually supposed to be connected. Um, and that's kind of the problem when it comes to attribution in any sort of computer crime, right? Um, especially, like we're saying here, when you're out on the outside looking in. Um, so earlier we were talking about Baelish, right? And his company, as, as well as the FBI, had the ability to be within Sony's infrastructure to at least have a bit more of a clue than we do. Now, we don't know that that means he knows exactly what happened, um, but all we know is we have less data than he did. And something interesting that came out of that uh, is this here. So are people familiar with um, CrowdStrike and Norse? Uh, they're two threat intelligence firms in, in you know, security. Um, so on the left here, we have a quote uh, from Dimitri, Dimitri, uh, the CTO of CrowdStrike, uh, saying, definitely, definitely North Korea. On the other side, we have a quote from Kurt Stamberger, uh, a senior vice president at Norse. As a side note, I couldn't find out what he was a senior vice president of. Um, but, but I found the quote and that's what I needed. Uh, he says, we are very confident that this was not an attack masterminded by North Korea. Um, so I don't put this up here to make a joke. Um, you know, I, I guarantee you that one of these is true. Uh, I'm just not gonna tell you which. Um, I should have said I don't put it up here to make a joke after that, um, because the real reason I put it up here is to say these are companies that take what they do seriously, right? These are people who put a lot of research in, I, I assume, um, to the theories that they make. The problem is despite that, and despite both of them, to give them, I guess, the benefit of the doubt, having reasons to say what they said, they disagree, right? And that's okay, disagreement is okay. Uh, it just means that there clearly isn't enough evidence out there for these people to find to know with absolute certainty what happened. Um, that's because clearly, uh, you know, there is no actual ground truth here, right? At least one of these groups uh, is wrong. Uh, so. I asked earlier, uh, I'm not really sure how many folks here have done instant response. Uh, if any of you have, you just didn't raise your hands, and I guess that's cool. I don't raise my hand either. Um, but I, I kind of have a phrase that it's really easy to tell when a computer has been compromised. Um, what's a lot harder is to tell when a computer hasn't been compromised. Right? When someone brings something across your desk and says, hey, was this owned? It's a lot safer to just say, yeah, blow it up. Right? Because there's really no risk to you in doing that. It's kind of covering your own butt. Um, the reason it's really hard to say a computer hasn't been compromised is because there's so many ways that an attacker can hide themselves, right? They can manipulate their environment much better than we can. Uh, if I decide to go a little crazy after my talk and rob a couple banks around here and get caught on tape, you know, maybe I'm wearing a wig, maybe I've got stilts on in one of the pictures or whatever, there are certain physical characteristics that are just plain, they exist, they're there. Um, when you're dealing with computers, these characteristics are often deletable, uh, removable and fakeable. So what you kind of have to note is that it's possible you're basing your conclusions on something that your attacker wanted you to see. Um, and one of these is a silly example. Uh, one of these is a real example. 
Um, I'll let you read yes. Has anyone ever heard of the Citadel malware? It's kind of like a build your own botnet kit. Um, there was a, does anyone know who Brian, does anyone not know who Brian Krebs is? Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, I ask you, but I'm gonna answer anyway. Uh, Brian Krebs is a very popular blogger journalist uh, when it comes to different computer crime and you know, spamming and malware and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so someone pointed out one day that uh, the top here is a screenshot out of the Citadel malware. Someone found a string in that malware that says, uh, coded by Brian Krebs for personal use only, I love my job and my wife. Uh, now it's possible, it's possible this is some crazy like meta 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 game and Brian Krebs really did make the Citadel malware. Um, maybe that'll be like my next talk, we'll kind of go into that, but uh, it's highly unlikely, right? Anyone can put anything that they want uh, in a copy of malware. Now that there I said was the silly example, but the one on the bottom is a lot more legitimate. Um, so when you're making Windows binaries, uh, you have this thing called a PDB. Uh, a PDB is something that Visual Studio can attach to your binary or kind of embed, a, embed part of within your binary uh, that includes debugging symbols, right? So if anyone here has ever run strings on a Windows executable, you might see something like this. Uh, inside that, you'll see something like uh, on the bottom right here, you'll see a file path. Um, so what we see at the bottom here is a website that's kind of helpfully collected a bunch of PDBs seen in known malware and associated it with who's done that. And the problem is anyone can make their PDB path anything that they'd like to. Right, again, this is another thing used for attribution. Attribution, you'll see it in Yara rule. Yara rules, a little bit of a tongue twister, um, that aren't really a positive sign of anything, right? They might be helpful, but you never know. That's totally the thing that anyone can put in any binary that they want um, to say, hey, you know, my name is actually Brian Krebs, and this is my Brian Krebs PDB folder. Um, it's kind of a silly thing to rely on. Um, it's not always silly, though. So when it comes to attribution, I kind of have uh, two types of attribution. Uh, and two, I guess, degrees of how well attributed something can, attributed something can be. Um, one type of attribution is trying to group um, actions to a particular uh, group, actor, or owner without knowing who that group, actor, or owner is. Right? So let's say you know, you're, you're, on a, you're in a SOC, you're in an incident response team. Over a week, you get a handful of phishing emails. All of those phishing emails have a very similar, similar set of characteristics. Uh, so you say, hey, I think the same group of people did all these things. Uh, it can be helpful. But another type of attribution is trying to say, hey, I think the same group of people did all these things, and I think I know exactly who was behind the keyboard at the time. Uh, that's a very challenging thing to do, especially when you don't have the abilities of someone like a law enforcement agency, but it's very difficult to do uh, then as well. Um, but also worth mentioning are different standards of attribution. Right, so let's say, again, I work in a SOC internal somewhere, and we have our own theories. Um, that's okay, that's cool. Like, let's say you know, we have the networking of the hill here, and uh, Brimstone here says, I think you're an idiot. And then I log into the Networking of the Hill and I see a big website that says, I think Brandon's an idiot. The odds that it was Brimstone are pretty high, right? It's not definite. I can't prove that he did it, but it's a reasonable suspicion. Um, so that's kind of being able to attribute something or attribute something to a reasonable degree. The next degree, which is a lot harder to have, is having a real defendable position, right? Something that can say, no, I can conclusively prove it was him who did that. Uh, and that's a lot harder to do. And something I don't think we've seen in terms of the Sony Pictures um, so I want to go into some clues that we see within the malware. Um, so to be clear here, my goal is not to tell you who did this, uh, but to say I don't think anybody can really tell you, or, or people who can tell you have not done an adequate job of proving it just yet. Um, so this example here uh, is one much like what we were just looking at in terms of kind of silliness, if we want to keep using that word. Um, this here, does anyone see anything that might be relevant to uh, pointing the finger at North Korea? It's kind of like an away check, or an AFK check, in terms of watching a presentation. Somebody can. Korean. Yep, language. Thank you. Okay, good. I was getting a little nervous. Um, so yeah, the language of the resources section in this binary is set as Korean. Who cares, right? People were kind of latching onto this, uh, and in kind of a dangerous way, because this is one case where people who, uh, frankly, I think should know better, were allowing people to think that this meant something, right? Because this is one of those cases where if I simply report the facts, I say, hey, the language section of this binary was Korean. That implies something, especially if I know that it really shouldn't imply much and don't mention it. Uh, it becomes a bit of a problem, because this is the sort of thing that anybody can set uh, for the binaries that they're compiling. Um, so it's really not a, a good sign of anything when you're looking for you know, really strongly defensible attribution. Uh, so finally, we're gonna talk, not finally, but uh, we're gonna talk about the, the malware that affected Sony Pictures a bit. Uh, so often people just say the malware, um, but what's important to distinguish uh, is that there were actually 
uh, two, sorry, uh, two different infection chains of this malware. Um, so for example, the screenshot on uh, your right uh, is the commonly posted one. Uh, you've probably seen this one on the internet before if you've ever looked into the breach. Uh, the one on the left you might not have seen before. Um, I'm not sure if anyone can really recognize the difference. They look very similar, but without the text, it's actually an important and notable difference. Uh, because earlier I mentioned the FBI's flash, right? If you would have downloaded all of the malware from that FBI flash, you would have never seen the image on the right. The image on the right came from a completely different set of malware that was not referenced uh, by the FBI. Uh, instead, you'll end up uh, installing the one on the left. Uh, where that picture comes from is from a web server that it actually drops on your machine. Uh, it puts some text in a scroll, shows that image, and plays a WAV file of gunshots. So it's actually a bit different. Um, and this difference was actually pretty interesting to me, um, because again, for one, it wasn't included in the flash. Uh, in addition, it wasn't until actually a week or two after the news was broken that we saw the sample on the right. Uh, and I, I think, and I'm not sure about this, I need to look into it a bit more, that Trend Micro uh, was actually the first person who, the first group uh, that had mentioned that second chain of samples. Um, you know, something that's kind of weird, uh, is anyone here familiar with the US CERT? Uh, the US Computer Emergency Readiness or Response Team. Um, oftentimes after a breach, they'll come in and do a more thorough investigation than you might see in the flash immediately following it. Uh, so I think it was December, mid-December that they posted their analysis. I think it was actually December 19th, which was inconvenient because it was the day after I gave my first presentation. Um, and they referenced a bunch of different types of malware. More malware than we'd actually seen. Uh, they referenced things that they called the SMB worm. Uh, they referenced what they called a lightweight backdoor. Um, and they referenced, I think I've got the name on the next slide in the notes, which are kind of invisible due to the link. Nope. Uh, anyway, they referenced a couple of different types of samples that we hadn't seen. What they never actually referenced, though, were the ones that um, Trend Micro uh, disclosed. Interesting, though, interestingly, though, we have to look at these IP addresses. Uh, so we see seven of them. On the top three, uh, the top three are IP addresses that were used in the second infection chain, I'm sorry, in the first infection chain, which was the one disclosed by the FBI. Now, the second set of IP addresses, the second three, actually appeared in Trend Micro's malware, which is weird because they never mentioned Trend Micro's malware. So why are they mentioning these IP addresses? Uh, in addition to that, we can actually see for the first three, uh, they tell you what files they came from. For the second three IP addresses, they don't mention the file names either. So it's a little bit bizarre um, because they clearly are aware of the existence of that malware, uh, but they never confirmed it. They never told us what that malware was about. Uh, so it's just a weird difference. Uh, in addition, has anyone here ever submitted anything to VirusTotal? I say thank you, um, because when you submit something to VirusTotal, I get the ability to play with it. All right, so VirusTotal is a really cool resource for us. It's actually, uh, to my knowledge, exactly where Trend Micro found uh, that second sample. But if we look at this, this is a list of hashes. Uh, and I'm just going to go out on a limb and assume no one recognizes those hashes. Uh, what their hashes are, pretty safe bet generally. Uh, what they are hashes of is the malware that the US CERT listed that none of us have seen before. So this was actually a screenshot that I had a friend take for me uh, just a week ago. Uh, I said, hey, you know, have you actually, can you double check virus total for me? He had the ability to do a bulk search. Can you tell me if any of this malware has actually come online? You know, I don't remember any of us seeing it. And what you can see on the bottom is zero results found. So it's very bizarre that all of those types of malware were kept properly under lock and key, um, but the first two samples made their way out there. Um, so the question is, even after a year, they, they weren't seen. Uh, so why were, I'm trying to think of the right name to describe it, why were the destructive malware samples that dropped screenshots uh, the ones that popped up online when none of the other ones did? So I'd like to talk a little bit about what the malware did. Um, and the best graphic I've seen to actually do that, again, came, train, came from Trend Micro. Uh, they've actually been pretty cool throughout this entire incident. Um, so this image here defects, depicts the second chain uh, the one that they found, it was the one that dropped the screenshot with the text. Uh, so what we see here is someone runs this file, it drops another copy of itself. That other copy of itself, of itself drops three more copies of itself. And this is kind of weird. Um, generally you don't see a binary make like 17 copies of itself to keep executing them, but this one did. Uh, anyway, that did three things. One, it began to scan other hosts in the network that it could reach uh, for different SMB shares and to try to authenticate to them. Um, it deleted the files on the computer, and it deleted the MBR of the computer. Um, again, destructive malware was kind of the name of this thing. In addition, uh, the first infection chain and the second in infection chain uh, parted ways here. Uh, the first one dropped a little web server. 
uh, dropped a web server with that scrolling text, that picture with no words on it, uh, and then put its own words over it, and the gunshot noise. Um, so this is complete speculation here, but presumably this is what they were trying to infect servers with. Right, so people would go to a Sony web server uh, and see this. Because the second one just dropped a background. Um, it dropped a background that was the file with the words. Um, so again, we don't know for sure why those two threads were there or why um, the FBI or US CERT never actually officially referenced uh, that second chain. But what was kind of cool were some of the things we saw in the malware. Um, so there's two screenshots here. One, uh, does anyone see anything cool in the left screenshot? Password. Thank you. The password was conveniently password. Um, we see here SPE standing for Sony Pictures Entertainment, uh, ADATA 2-1, uh, looking like a username, right? Uh, we see LA Data, which was a file share, and then we see password123, which was a admittedly quite bad password. Um, and then we see under that a command for net use. Uh, so this is what the malware actually used to spread within Sony's network. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we see some uh, black and green blinky text uh, with host names and IP addresses. Um, a little bit of trivia, what you might recognize here is that those IPs you see on the right are public IPs. Uh, what it came out to say was that Sony Pictures was actually using public IPs uh, in a private fashion. Don't know why, um, but they were. Um, so this list here was actually appended to the end of one of the file samples uh, and encrypted, it was XOR encrypted. Uh, so by kind of brute forcing that, you were able to pluck this out and see that it had more credentials encoded within itself and a bunch of internal Sony uh, file name, excuse me, uh, host names and IPs. Uh, and again, this is one of those things that kind of people referenced to suggest that it had to be insider involvement. Again, they knew all about the infrastructure, but we've already kind of disagreed with that, or at least I have, right? Because the attackers leaked IT docs. It doesn't mean anything about it being actually an insider threat. Um, so here, this brings us back around to IPs, right? So I, I don't want to mislead here. Uh, it's very unlikely, given the context, that Comey was referencing the IPs and the malware. Um, but the quote says, the key fact cited by Comey to justify his agency's continued suspicion was the evidence of the attacker's IP addresses, the 12-digit string that identifies the location of a remote computer. Now, the first, uh, when I first pasted this here, it was really just because I thought describing an IP address as 12 digits that you know, references the location of a piece of malware uh, of, a, of a computer was kind of funny, but realistically, it's probably an okay simplification uh, when you're trying to speak to a non-tech audience. Um, but the real reason I put it here is to kind of stress the importance of IP addresses when it comes to attribution, right? Um, but the problem is that wasn't really particularly doable here. Uh, so here we have two hosts. One is a green smiley face, representing a, a computer that we have infected with malware. Bizarrely, it's smiley, but hey, it's cool. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we have a command and control host. Uh, so traditionally, or typically, in a malware infection, it looks kind of like this, right? You have a, an infected host that reaches out to a command and control server, the command and control server hears them, responds back with a command, and that bot does whatever they need to do. Now, so this is kind of helpful for us because it tells us that the attacker was actually involved in that remote IP. It doesn't mean that they owned that IP address. Uh, lots of command and control servers are actually compromised via regular hosts. But what it does tell us is that the attacker was involved there because those commands came back, right? So we knew someone had to put the commands there. Uh, so that's why you know IP reputation feeds work, um, that sort of thing. But the Sony Pictures malware worked a little bit differently. The Sony Pictures malware uh, would send out a beacon, it would send out a message to a command and control server, but didn't actually care about a response, right? Um, so I found this out because when I first pulled down that malware, uh, I ran it offline. I had it in an analysis network, but not connected to the actual internet. Despite the fact that there was no internet access, it tried to communicate with the command and control server. It obviously failed, and then it just did everything anyway. Uh, it blew up the machines I put it on, it put us, you know, gave us the image, it gave us the backdrop, it tried to brute force those other internal hosts. Um, but again, that command and control wasn't actually important. Um, so this tells me that that is really one of the things I'd argue if I were a defense attorney here, right? You know, these IPs are pointed at me, my IP is in the malware, but you don't know that that IP was actually important. And so for anyone like me who knows nothing about fish, this is supposedly a herring, uh, a red herring, which is what I'm calling these IP addresses, potentially. Right? Because those of us on the outside wouldn't actually be able to see whether or not that traffic was received and responded to uh, by an attacker. So for example, if I were to put your IP address in the malware, uh, the malware is found, discovered, and someone says, hey, well their IP was in the malware, it must have been them. And that's not true, right? Because you wouldn't have had any knowledge. You wouldn't have actually responded, you wouldn't have responded to that. Um, so it's not really a good way to prove that you were actually involved. Um, so really within the malware, that was the kind of key piece of attribution, the key concrete piece of attribution, and it's just not a good one. 
right? These IP addresses might have been live. Again, I'm not saying they're not. We just don't know that they were. So you can't rely on that as like your cornerstone piece of evidence here. In addition, I wanted to talk a little bit about the communications from the attackers. Uh, so I showed you a handful of emails earlier. Most of those were accompanied with data, uh, which is how they tried to prove their authenticity. Um, but not all of them were. So this here is a headline from, uh, I think it was The Verge, that says, Sony, picture hackers, Sony Pictures hackers say they want equality, worked with staff to break in. Um, so as I've been saying, there's kind of been a lack of information, especially the sort that's kind of easily parsable by uh, reporters. So we see this headline. Uh, and then to continue the article, we get this blurb here. Um, let's see, so just to read a little bit, it says, the hackers who took down the network uh, say that they are working for equality and suggest that their attack was assisted or carried out by Sony employees. Um, in an email responding to inquiries from The Verge, a person identifying as one of the hackers writes something. Um, so this here actually is part of the things that started the whole insider threat, or the, the whole insider theory. But if we move on, we see that that was kind of not appropriate. Because you can read this whole blurb, and it's actually kind of interesting, um, but there's a problem here. So it says, again, we've worked with other staff with similar interests to get in, and it even suggests a physical vector. It mentions doors being left open. But let's take a look at what we have highlighted in red. It says here that the email address in question is an open account, which allows anyone to send mail from it without entering a password. That means it's possible the message was sent by someone with no relation to the attack itself. Well, hang on, that's a little problematic. And even more problematic was that this was not there when that message, when that uh, article was initially published. This is not something the reporters were aware of. So they got this email, assumed it was legitimate, ran with it. And this is the sort of thing that other people say, well, hey, as reported by those guys, the attackers communicated with us. And they don't leave any room for doubt that it was actually the attackers. Um, because take a look at this. Again, this is the readme.txt uh, that was in the initial um, spdata.zip from the background. What we see here is a, a handful of emails from Yapmail and Spambog. Uh, so has anyone heard of those services before? No. Okay, good. I didn't want anyone to have heard of those before, so that was convenient. Uh, has anyone heard of Mailinator? Cool. Uh, so Mailinator is kind of a, a system that will receive email to any address. And anyone can go to Mailinator, type in that email address, and look at the inbox. No authentication. It's made for like one-time use disposable things to sign up for weird services that you don't want to have your email address. Um, Yup, Mail, and Spambug were very much the same, but they went a step further. Not only could anyone read these emails, but anyone could send from them. Uh, so given that information, I did what anybody would do, and I read them. Um, so this here's a screenshot for an email that was sent to one of these accounts. Uh, Lena at spambog.com. Forget if it's dot, yep, dot com. Uh, so it says, hi, my name is this guy. I cover Sony for Bloomberg News in Tokyo. Uh, could you please add me to whatever mailing list you have for social media? Thanks, it is. Uh, so I also responded. But I responded from a different mail account that wasn't that one, um, you know, a professional account, uh, and asked him a couple questions. Uh, one, did anybody respond? Two, did you know that anybody you know, could have responded? It was an unauthenticated account. And three, if anyone responded, uh, did anyone offer proof that they were who you kind of assumed they were? He said, yes, people responded. No, I didn't know that. And no, nobody offered any proof. Um, so this is the sort of thing that can be, uh, I guess, causes a lot of chaos. Uh, it's the sort of thing where no one really knows who they're talking to, but they don't know that they don't know who they're talking to. So people take this as gospel and begin to publish what they say as if it's really the attacker saying it. Uh, in addition, something that I wanted to reiterate, and we actually talked about it, a little bit about it on the way through, is that the attackers didn't mention the, email, uh, the interview publicly uh, until, I think, the date that we have here is December 16th, right? So whether or not they were actually after the interview the whole time, they decided to latch onto a public theory and run with it, uh, we simply don't know, right? And beyond that, another email. Uh, this is a screenshot from WikiLeaks, who conveniently uh, hosts the archives that were leaked in a completely searchable and indexed way. Um, so we see this email that was sent to the executives, a lot of people with leaked inboxes, right? Michael Linton, Amy Pascal. Anyway, from some weird email address, dfrank1973.david at gmail.com. Uh, it says, we've got great damage by Sony Pictures. Now, the compensation for it, monetary compensation we want. Pay the damage or Sony Pictures will be, will be bombarded as a whole. You know us very well, we never wait long. You better behave wisely from God's apostles. Uh, so that's not the GOP. Right? That's not the Guardians of Peace, um, but it's actually kind of important, as you can tell because I've emphasized it here. Uh, if we look at this screenshot that was actually dropped by the first infection chain, the one that dropped web servers, you'd see this message. Um, I've highlighted what I want you to care about here. You're welcome to care about the rest of it too, though. In the red box, we actually say, thanks a lot to God's apostles, attributing your great effort to the peace of the world. 
Um, so whether or not God's apostles and you know the guardians of peace were actually different groups, you know, I don't know, and I'm not trying to uh, speculate one way or the other. Um, but what we do know is that this is another way that attackers clearly tried to add complexity um, to the identification, right? Just throwing in a lot more wrenches that people have been taking with and running with and using as pro positive proof for something. Um, but we've also kind of been our own worst enemies because right? it hasn't just been the attackers doing that. Uh, so here we have Business Insider reporting on a pastebin uh, message that says at the top, by GOP, and they say it was from the attackers because by GOP were, were the attackers. So we know that's true. Um, it says here, the result of investigations uh, by CNN is so excellent that you might have seen what we were uh, doing with your own eyes. I'm going to skip some because we're close to dinner and people kind of look hungry. And there's a YouTube link, and at the bottom, my favorite part, it says, P.S., you have 24 hours to give us the wolf. <laughs> wolf Blitzer, presumably being someone who works for CNN. Uh, still does because they did not give them the wolf. Um, the FBI also shared this sentiment. Uh, they posted a jib, I think it's a, a joint intelligence bulletin, saying that this were the attackers. They said the attackers said these things against US person one and US person two. It's crazy, right? This is not something that makes sense. Um, so as a quick question, is anyone in here David Garrett Jr.? He lives in Knoxville, I figured I'd try. Um, this is someone who took ownership for those tweets. He said, hey, hang on, that was the joke. I tweeted that and people are kind of running with this and the FBI is investigating it now. Um, I didn't mean to do that, this is a little weird. Now, just because we have to be suspicious, we don't actually know that this was him. Um, but still, the, the fact is clear that it's very plausible that it was, right? So people are, again, saying it was the GOP, it must have been them, you know, they want Wolf Blitzer. Um, and it's just things that people are posting on Pastebin. And there were so many of them. You just search GOP on Pastebin and you'd get a bunch of messages and you'd see people reporting on them. Now, kind of cool, I couldn't figure out how to get a YouTube video offline into my PowerPoint. And I don't want to have to rely on the internet because you know, everything else has gone super well, technically. Um, but if you would have clicked the link, you would have gotten a video that contained about three minutes of this plus music. <laughs> you should look it up. I'll actually send out the link. It's just a really ridiculous video with kind of like high-pitched, you are an idiot uh, music uh, from a piece of malware from years and years and years ago. Uh, anyway, the point of this is that people are taking this unauthenticated information, running with it, and using it as building blocks in a theory for attribution. And it just doesn't make sense to do that. Um, so here, again, we don't have access to the actual network traffic that took place on Sony's network. Um, but what we do have are a few things to, that we can actually take a look at. Uh, one of them was the malware. Um, we discussed here that one of the key ways you attribute malware is IP addresses. And the IP addresses here, for all we know, were complete bunk. They were completely red herrings. Not that they, I'm not saying they were, but I'm saying they very well could have been, uh, and we don't know otherwise. Uh, we looked at the communications, right? We saw clear attempts to uh, aim, to, aim to mislead for example, saying, ah, the way you should contact us legitimately is by emailing us at Yapmail and Spambog, these open services that anybody can read and respond from. Why would you do that? Because you want to kind of create some chaos. Um, and we saw people take those communications seriously and report on them and build theories on them. Uh, and then finally, the data. So I've unbolded data. Uh, I've unbolded it because it's by far what I've done the least uh, work and investigation into. Um, there's a lot of it. So I want to point it out that it's possible there's some crazy, you know, cryptographically verifiable signature in there to prove to you who did it. Um, but if there is any information like that, nobody has presented it yet. Um, so again, here, uh, until these questions are answered, I assert the, it's impossible for a fair ruling to be made. Um, what I'm not saying is, A, the FBI is wrong. They very well might be right, but they haven't given us enough information to prove it. Now, whether they feel the need to prove it or not it is their own prerogative, right? Um, but I want to make it clear I'm not specifically here to say they're wrong. I'm just saying they haven't proved it. Uh, and the same for anyone else who, you know, who has a theory. I just don't think there's enough information out there for any of us uh, to come with a defendable theory, right? Uh, I've referenced the difference between kind of a reasonable attribution and a defendable one. I think there are plenty of reasonable um, attributions. I don't think there are any really defendable ones. Uh, so with that, a little bit of further reading. Um, there's two links here that you obviously can't click on, um, but Googling these headlines will get you, will get you to the pages. Uh, first is a Deadline article. Uh, I think they're, uh, what I found out is that they're kind of like an entertainment blog uh, magazine. They actually did really well as the attack was happening, summing up all of the info uh, that was out there. What was in the leaks? What were some of the popular communications? Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, a great post by Risk-Based Security. Um, so I didn't find their post until the second time around when I was revisiting the incident to make this presentation. Um, but they had a really great analysis of the data and more kind of higher level analysis too. Um, so if you're interested, you should definitely take a look. Uh, and for those of us who are more interested in the low-level malware, the tech, 
uh, feel free to find me. I've got tons of marked up IDBs and disassemblies uh, and would love to chat your ear off. Uh, that's actually kind of why I wanted to do this talk, but it just didn't really seem like the appropriate thing uh, to discuss at length. So if anyone here is interested, please do seek me out. Uh, and with that, I'll say thanks and ask for questions, but I first want to point out, um, as I was Googling around and reading different websites, I found this awesome internet comment here uh, saying, indeed, the interview will be remembered as the film that made Hollywood realize they can engage in a new distribution model. Because that is the thing that the interview will definitely be remembered by all of us. You know, the success of their online release and not all of the other cluster uh, that kind of surrounded the breach. Uh, so thank you, trauma. Uh, so with that, I will um, tweet out the, a link to my slides with the notes on them. Uh, it'll be a day as I clean them up or whatever, but uh, feel free to shoot me an email if you want them, uh, or if you've got any questions that you don't want to ask now for whatever reason. So thanks.